So we're going to follow the same format as last time. Cooper's got some video segments that we'll go through. And then I'll kind of point out the sections of the handout where we're going to be answering some questions. This is, this is a situation where um, some pretty compelling questions here, I guess you could say, ones that are we wouldn't normally think about when we're reading the book of Job. So let me start the video, and then we will go from there. Good morning. Uh, Chris Strand will be again facilitating our class, uh, Sunday school class this morning. A special thank you to him. Uh, I will be back with you next week. This week, I am out of town uh, with some friends of mine from high school. We are watching a college football game together over at Notre Dame uh, on Saturday, uh, and then I'll be uh, flying back in town on, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so this class, uh, we are going to be continuing our work through the book of Job. Uh, we're going to start like we normally do with a little bit of a review, and then we're going to look ahead to what's coming in the book in the coming chapters. And then we're going to spend a good chunk of, <coughs> of the class today uh, looking at what does it mean to preach Job and to teach Job and to study Job like a Christian uh, that is in a distinctively Christ-centered kind of way? Uh, so uh, by way of review, we wanted to look, uh, I want us to keep in mind the basic building blocks of the book so that as you go through this book, you can kind of have it under your belt uh, through the main, the main units. We looked at Job 1 and 2 with Job's trials. Uh, Job 3 is him cursing the day of his birth. His struggle is so severe that he wishes he had never been born. And then we see speech cycle number one, speech cycle number two, and speech cycle number three. Again, as a reminder, these cycles are where Job's three friends take turns telling Job uh, why he has done wrong and needs to confess his sin, and Job in responding to each friend, holding fast to his integrity and claiming uh, that he has done nothing to deserve this suffering. And so we see each friend speak three times, that's cycle one, and then each friend speaks again in cycle two, and each friend speaks again in cycle three. So these can be summarized uh, with Job 4 through 27 as the three speech cycles. Uh, so Job 1 and 2, Job 3, Job 4 through 27. And then last week, we looked at Job 28, which I called the hymn, the interlude, uh, a wisdom hymn, where the narrator kind of breaks in, slows down the chaos that happened during those speech cycles, and is able to kind of reframe the conversation and get us ready for these movements towards the Yahweh speeches, which really are the climax of the book. Uh, and then Job 29 through 31 is Job's uh, final speech. Uh, we looked at this last week. Job uh, is the first of the three long speeches, the monologues at the end of the book. We have Job, Elihu, and Yahweh, who each speak for extended periods. And in Job's final speech, he holds fast to his integrity. Uh, he longs for a trial where he can see God. And he really laments uh, how far he has fallen from his, from his uh, earlier days. And so these are the big chunks of the book that we've gone through. And hopefully this is kind of sinking in and you may be even able to outline and to sketch these chapters or at least the order of how this book has flowed with this, uh, the trials at the beginning, cursing the day of his birth, the speech cycles, the hymn to wisdom, and then Job's final speech. Uh, and so I wanted to make a quick comment about the structure of the book, especially regarding chapter 28. So we spent a lot of time last week looking at chapter 28, and I argued that this is not Job talking, this is instead the narrator talking. And I wanted to uh, look at two different ways of talking about the structure. So the first is this, is this could be the plot of Job. This is a significant way of understanding the structure. You have the narrative prologue that kind of uh, sets the stage for how things are gonna go. And then the action really starts rising in the dialogue cycles. The, there's a lot that happens in the narrative uh, in the story where Job suffers from the hands of the adversary, from Satan. But really, the theology of the book kind of uh, and the, the emotion of the book really uh, takes off somewhere in the narrative and continues through the dialogue cycles. And then the hymn of wisdom, chapter 28 slows everything down. It kind of, instead of having this rapid rise, it kind of slows down. And then we have the monologues, which continue to increase the tension of the book that brings us to the climax of the Yahweh speeches. So this is one way of kind of understanding how the book works as a whole. 
Uh, and then we have chapter 42, the epilogue, which we haven't gotten to yet, which is how things end. Uh, but there's another way of looking at the structure of the book, uh, which is one of the reasons that I think chapter 28 does function as the narrator, and it would look something like this. So at the beginning, we have the narrative prologue. That's the story of Job, his two cycles of suffering at the hands of Satan. At the, uh, then we have our three dialogue cycles, which, we, which we've looked at before. And we also, I've talked about the three monologues, and so you can kind of imagine that those match the three dialogue cycles. The monologues are Job's extended speech last week, Elihu's speech, and Yahweh's speech. And we also have a narrative epilogue where there's a story at the end where Job is restored and his family return, uh, uh, the, the community rallies around him. He's able, he restores his wealth, his family, uh, he has more children. So you see how these match the narrative prologue, narrative epilogue, three dialogue cycles, three monologue cycles. And what is it that's right in the middle? The hymn of wisdom, which again, so the, the chapter 28 functions like a hinge structurally, and it's the middle point of the book, which highlights the fact that wisdom alone comes from God. And this is the structural center that then prepares us for the climax of the Yahweh speeches, which we'll see, uh, which we'll get to uh, next, starting next week. So again, that, that's just kind of uh, by way of review, uh, wanting to help you get a feel for the whole book. We're getting to enough through enough chapters and enough content. Uh, that we can get the whole book under our belt. So a couple of review questions then uh, for you to discuss uh, together how, uh, however Chris facilitates that part of the discussion. Before this class, which section from the book were you most familiar with? And then why do you think that's the case? Why do you think that you were most familiar with that particular section of the book? And then the same question, but the opposite, right? Before this class, which section from the book were you most unfamiliar with? And why do you think that's the case? So considering especially the parts that we've already gone through, which of these was the most familiar? Which of these was the most unfamiliar? And why? And then what key themes are re-emphasized in Job's final speech? Uh, this was from last week. And how do they helpfully summarize the dialogue cycles? As we kind of leave the dialogue cycles behind and are moving towards the Yahweh speeches, how does Job's final speech encapsulate some key content and some key themes uh, from the dialogue cycles? Uh, so uh, I'll let Chris uh, lead that discussion, and then uh, we'll see you back here for the next part of uh, the video. All right. <clears throat> On your handout, you'll see the, th the questions there. If you want to take just a few minutes, go through those, put some thoughts into those, and then we will uh, chat about it a little bit, and we'll go from there. You can work as groups, that's always helpful. Or if you're embarrassed by what your answers might be, you can work by yourself. All right, anyone wanna share which parts you were most familiar with of the book of Job and why or why that was the case? Craig. Sure. The book of Job, all it is is a bunch of suffering. Okay? We tend to focus in on that. Oh, Karen has a different view. Different view in the same household. So the friends became less friend-like as we went along, as we went into the book. Any other thoughts on which sections were most familiar to you? Gary? The restoration, the restoration part was most familiar to you? The end of the book. He, he starts at the end of the book. How about unfamiliar? Everything between, everything between the beginning and the end. Elihu's criticism, which comes later. We haven't gotten to that yet. It's okay. It's okay. Kevin? Sure. 
Sure, it's all very horizontal, isn't it? Kind of in a lot of ways, the discussion that's going on. So it's all very horizontal. Um, you know, just the fact that these dialogues went in a cycle, I guess it never, I've read Job several times over the years, and just the, it just never really dawned on me that there's these cycles going on. Greg. I, I, like, I like to think that anyway. So there's a third question there. What key themes are re-emphasized in Job's final speech? which was basically 29 through 31, chapters 29 through 31. If you had to pick anything out of there, what would they be? The key themes. What's his theme in, in chapter 29? Look at verses four to eight. This is Job speaking here now. He says, as I was in the prime of my days when the friendship of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me and my children were around me, when my steps were bathed in butter. Boy, I like that one. And the rock poured out for me streams of oil. When I went out to the gate of the city, when I took my seat in the square, the young men saw me and hid themselves and the old men arose and stood. What's his point there? Greg? Life was good. Man, things were really good. But then what? Chapter 29. Look at verse, well, excuse me, chapter 30. Look at verse 1. But now those younger than I mock me, whose fathers I disdain to put with the dogs of my flock. Then jump down to verse 9. And now I have become their taunt. I have even become a byword to them. They abhor me and stand aloof from me, and they do not refrain from spitting at my face. What's his perspective now? In his mind. So was he rightfully put on a pedestal by others, do you think? How is he described way back in chapter 1? He was righteous. So in a way, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that he was looked at by the people in this way. He was a wealthy man. He had all the trappings of wealth, and he was righteous in the sight of God. Paul. To the others. Yes. <laughs> you know, I heard an interesting saying yesterday. Don't let insults go to your heart and don't let compliments go to your head. So, I tend to think, though, that in this particular case, Job, in his righteousness, was highly respected. Not just because of his wealth, because of his position, but I think in his righteousness, he was highly respected by those around him. But to your point now, though, now that he's experiencing this hardship, you know, was his wealth a reflection of his righteousness or the result of his righteousness? Uh, people may be thinking, hmm, maybe he wasn't so good after all. So now, therefore, he's to uh, an extent, to Gene's point, he maybe is being knocked off the pedestal. But definitely at this point, in his own mind, things are really bad, right? In chapter 30, things are really, really bad. But then look at chapter 31. One thing that Job does do, we talked about this last week, verses 4 to 8. Let me read that. Does he not see my ways, referring to God here, and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened after deceit, let him weigh me with accurate scales and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way or my heart followed my eyes, or if any spot has stuck to my hands, let me sow and another eat and let my crops be uprooted. So when we talked last week about Job, we did see that he held to his integrity the whole time. And remember, we made the point that Job wasn't even willing to confess, if you want to put those in air quotes, to sin in order to, to get the pain to stop. He was not willing to do that because he knew that by doing so, that would 
impugn his integrity. So he wasn't even willing to do that. And it's interesting to note in chapter 31, look at all the phrases that start with, if I, if I, if I. If I've done any of these things, then yes, I deserve punishment. But I haven't done these things. So therefore, I don't know why I'm being punished. I wanted to comment a little bit about the structure of the book. Pastor Cooper brought that up. Job is really an amazing piece of literature. Um, not only from the content, but even from a structural point of view. When we're looking at scripture, particularly narrative scripture, for example, there's a pattern that it goes through. All good literature follows this type of a pattern. There's some background information that's given that sets up the story, introduces the characters, things like that. We see that in Job chapter 1, particularly verses 1 to 5. And then a problem develops. And that problem occurs, and we looked at it in Job chapter 1 again, verse 6, then all the way through 2.13, where we're dealing with Satan uh, putting the, the, the wager onto Job. And then following that, the plot builds, the suspense builds, all the way through. What's going to happen here? What's going to happen with Job? What's going to happen with these three friends? Until eventually, in the narrative plot, we reach this climax point where there's a solution to the problem. And this is the point where God intervenes. And then after that, it drops down to a conclusion where we get to the restoration of Job. That's a very common structure used in biblical narrative. There's a little bit of a quirk to it, as Pastor Cooper showed, with that, that, that hymn of wisdom that interludes right in there. kind of calms things down, but we're on our way to that point of climax within the, within the narrative. The other thing, too, that he brought out was, aren't whiteboards great? Job is written in what's called a chiastic structure. And it's interesting to note that the entire book is in a chiastic structure. And he brought that out. And with the chiasm, think of it this way. We got A, we got B, and we got C, and then we got B, little extra mark there, and then we got A, little extra mark there. So there's a flow to the book based on this chiastic structure. Chiasms are very common in scripture, especially the Old Testament. But it's interesting to see that the entire book of Job is a chiasm in how it's laid out. So be looking for that type of narrative flow when you read through scripture and be looking for structures like this. And Job gives us a very good example. All right, let's move on to the next segment. All right. Uh, so now moving on to Job and Jesus or reading Job as a Christian. So the question is, how do we understand this book Christianly, right? That's not a real word, but I put it in quotation marks. Or what keeps our interpretation from being merely Jewish? I've been captured by this idea that when we read and teach Old Testament texts, if our interpretation is the exact same interpretation that a Jewish rabbi could give, we haven't fully entered in to what that text means for us as Christians today. The book of Job is not merely a text for Jewish people. It's a Christian text that's part of our Christian Bible, meaning that Jesus is the climax and the center of God's plan for redemption. So how is it that we read and study and interpret the book of Job in light of the person and work of Jesus. How do we understand this book Christianly? So that's kind of, that's the, to, uh, the a topic that I want to talk through today. So of course, the first question is, uh, Jesus in the Old Testament, how does this happen? And there's a key text uh, in the book of Luke chapter 24. Jesus is talking with some disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they, uh, he asked them, you know, why is it that you, uh, what, that, what you're doing here? And they said, are you the only person who doesn't know about Jesus of Nazareth, how he's been crucified from the, uh, at the hands of the high priest? And now there are some people who the women have said that he, that he has risen. And we had two disciples that went to the tomb and his body wasn't there, but we're not sure what's happened. 
And then Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. And he says these words in Luke 24. He, Jesus, said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? He says, how did you miss the message? Isn't this what the Messiah had to do to suffer and then enter into glory? And this is the key verse. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And so what we want to take away from this is that the Old Testament bears a powerful witness to Jesus. And it seems like Jesus is saying that there's more here than just fulfilling prophecies, right? That he was born in Bethlehem, but that instead there are realities throughout scripture that point to the truth and work of Jesus. And so we are justified in recognizing that the Old Testament prepares us and, in, and teaches us about the person and work of Jesus and who he is. And so the question is, how do we do this rightly? And so I want to look at some of the options for reading the book Christianly in the book of Job. And so there's a bunch of different ways that people have found Jesus in the book of Job, or in other or not even found Jesus, but uh, been able to reflect into uh, on the person and work of Christ to better understand who Jesus is for us and who God is for us in Christ. And one of the ways that people have uh, argued that the book of Job should be understood is that Jesus is like Job or that Job is like Jesus, uh, that they both suffer due to no fault of their own and lose everything. They are faithful in their sufferings and commended by God, uh, and they are ultimately restored to blessing and fortune, right? Something like that. Uh, and they also, they both intercede on behalf of others as Job intercedes for his friends at the end of the book. So there's connections between Jesus and Job so that some people have said, one of the ways we teach this book Christianly is that when we look at the person of Job, we realize that he helps us, uh, he shows us a little bit clearer who Jesus is. Another option is that we can uh, obviously make the connection between Jesus and Yahweh, God. Uh, just as God acts in the Old Testament toward Job, Jesus is God. So we learn about the person and work of Jesus by looking at the work of Yahweh in the book of Job, uh, that Jesus, that, that the Yahweh speeches and the way that Yahweh acts towards the Satan, giving him permission to afflict Job and those sorts of things, allow him or uh, allow us to better understand the work of Jesus. So some have argued that Christ is Job. Some have argued that Christ is Yahweh. Uh, this is William Blake. Uh, he's named this uh, image, the vision of Christ. So the Yahweh speeches, he makes them uh, the speeches of Christ, that he hears Christ's words uh, in God's speech to Job. And that, that's a significant component. If, if we're reading them in such a way that these don't seem to be Jesus' words, then we may be doing something wrong. Uh, another option is that Christ could be Job's mediator. There's several verses there about where uh, Job has raised the idea that he needs someone as a go-between between between him and God, uh, that he desires this mediator, uh, someone who can plead his case and can make the law court imagery work. And so some have said, who is the mediator between man and God, uh, but Jesus? And so Job is crying out for Jesus. In a sense, this is even, some have even said like a prophecy that Job is predicting and, and crying out for the Messiah who would be his mediator uh, between uh, Job and God. Uh, we've seen, uh, and then there's been the argument that Christ is the wisdom of God. Uh, in Job 28, the hymn to wisdom that where can wisdom be found? Wisdom, all wisdom is found in Christ. And so when we're talking about where is Jesus in the book of Job, there are lots of options that have been provided throughout church history, uh, different ways that we can see Jesus uh, in this book. And so kind of hearing briefly those ideas, I want you to choose one or two of these. 
uh, and, and think about Christ as, right? Christ as Job, Christ as Yahweh, Christ as Job's mediator, Christ as uh, God's wisdom. Does thinking of Christ as one or two of those ideas help you to reflect meaningfully on the person and work of Jesus? Why or why not? So the first thing I want us to do, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And pick one or two of those and ask yourself, does thinking of Jesus as connected to this reality in the book of Job help me to reflect meaningfully on the person and work of Jesus? Why or why not? Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, at the end um, about uh, ways to think about finding Jesus uh, in the Old Testament. All right, on your handout, you've got that list. Christ as Job, Christ as Yahweh, Christ as Job's mediator, and Christ as God's wisdom. So your task, and I'm going to be very interested to hear what some of your responses are, uh, is to choose one or two of these and then ask yourself, does thinking of Christ as, fill in the blank, help you reflect meaningfully on the person and work of Jesus? Why or why not? Pretty challenging question. <laughs> this is an essay. Yeah, this is an essay question. All right, so tackle that one. Discuss it with your neighbors.
All right. Who would like to share your thoughts? A very challenging question. Anybody have any thoughts? Craig. Christ is Yahweh. Sure. So in this faith journey, we need to come to the conclusion that Jesus is who he says he is. And you're quoting C.S. Lewis, Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? We all have to come to that point where we make that decision. So Christ is Yahweh, okay? Any, any other thoughts? Terry. Christ is Job, okay? Sure, Christ as, as Job started out with uh, all the good things in life, just like Jesus Christ in heaven was sent down, suffered, just like Job suffered, and then was restored back to all of the good things in life. And as we go forward in Job, we realize that everything is doubled for Job. So, Right. Point, Paul's point is Jesus didn't say that his suffering was unjust. We'll leave that one there. <laughs> Any other thoughts on the question? Christ as fill in the blank. We've got two of them covered. Christ as mediator. Okay, Gary. Gary's quoting Job 19.25. We get to that. Somebody should write a song about that. I think somebody did. 19.25, where it says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. So Christ, Job, Christ as mediator for Job, in this case, as Job's mediator. Okay, we have three of them covered. Anyone look at the idea of Christ as God's wisdom? Or look at it. Anyone consider that idea? The hymn of wisdom. Leah. Okay. Jesus referring to himself as the way and the truth, truth being wisdom. There's a connection there. I'm going to throw it out there just to say, you know what? Cooper will be back next week, and he's going to give you the answer. <laughs> Actually, I'm just being facetious, because I don't know if there really is a right answer in this particular case. But as we go forward in the book, I think Cooper's going to be sharing some things that will help us to see possibly all of these aspects come into play. It all, it'll all kind of pull together as we move forward. So go ahead, Paul. Right. Not that we see in the book of Job. And there's several ways that that passage is looked at for interpretation. 
Yes. <laughs> James, you look skeptical. It's a very comforting passage. I will, I will definitely, I've told my wife, I said, I think that's a very appropriate passage for my tombstone. I would, I, I would even include uh, verse 26. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. So, lots of different ways that that is looked at. There's a, there's a Hebrew word in there, the word min, which has some impact on how it's, the verse is considered. So, all right, we need to move ahead. Way to dodge the question, right, Chris? All right, so for this final video, I want to talk about ways of seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. And I'm contrasting what is going to be called a Christocentric reading and a Christotelic reading. Those are fancy terms, but we're going to hopefully unpack them a little bit so you can understand them a little bit better. So Christocentric, Christ is at the center of every Old Testament text, right? With this kind of reading, a Christocentric reading, Christ is at the center of every kind of text. And so basically a Christocentric approach says that the Old Testament refers specifically to Jesus in many details and characters. That's a Christocentric reading of the Old Testament. And there's an example I, I'll give in Joshua 2.18, right? So in Joshua 2.18 is when Rahab uh, lay in, in the battle for uh, the city of Jericho, the prostitute Rahab, who was going to be saved because of her faithfulness towards the Israelite spies. She is told to lay down out of her window a red scarlet cord. And that cord will signal to the Israelite army, don't attack this house where you see this red cord. That, that cord will be salvation for you and your family, it says. Christocentric readings have said this red cord is a picture of Jesus and his blood sacrifice. It is a red cord, just like, the blo like Jesus' blood is red. It is a red cord that leads to the salvation of her, of her and, 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 and others with her, right? Just like Jesus' blood leads to salvation. Uh, it is something that must be appropriated. She has to take it and, and do something with it. She has to accept it uh, as, a, as a gift, those kinds of things. And so there are people who have said this cord always refers to Jesus, a Christocentric reading would say that to uh, that this was always intended to be about Jesus and his work. Now, I don't hold to a Christocentric approach. Instead, I hold to what is called a Christotelic approach. Telos, and so all of the Old Testament finds its ultimate aim, or telos. There's not a really great English word, but it, like its ultimate fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus. So the first thing we need to do is understand the word, this idea of the aim or the telos. Like the telos of a chair is that it is sat in. That's its aim. That's its purpose. That's its function. That's its ultimate end goal. The telos of a really good meal is that it is eaten and enjoyed. That's what it's designed for. And so the Old Testament finds its ultimate telos its ultimate end, its ultimate aim in the person and work of Jesus. So every theme, lesson, and character is in a how much more in Jesus kind of relationship. Okay? So some have had me for class before, and I, I do this idea of a how much more kind of a move. That's what I mean when I talk about a Christotelic interpretation. So let's again look at Joshua 2.18, the court of Rahab. What I would say is this, the red cord does not refer to, Ray, to, to Jesus's blood. But I would say something like, in the story of Rahab, this red cord was a free sign or was a, a, a free mechanism, a free means by which salvation could come to Rahab. It saved this prostitute. It led to her 
being graciously preserved through battle, incorporated into the people, and ultimately one of Jesus's ancestors. How much more is Jesus's gift better for us, right? Like that it saves us not from temporary, uh, not from, from death and battle, but from spiritual death forever. It doesn't just save us temporarily from one enemy. It saves us forever from our ultimate enemies of sin and death and evil. So the red cord there doesn't refer to Jesus, but it does give us an idea of something that Jesus does even better. It provides a kind of limited salvation for a limited amount of people in a limited scope. How much more is the work of Jesus even better? So that's a Christotelic approach to scripture. And so I want to look at the difference here with the book of Job. And so when we see Christ as all of these options then become viable for the interpreter, Job, a righteous sufferer, we, we uh, uh, identify with Job. And so when Job suffers, we feel it in a significant way. In a sense, this makes Jesus more relatable to us. When we read of Jesus in the wilderness, at times I find myself thinking, ah, how great, how really great was his suffering anyway? I mean, after all, he is God. But when we realize that and we empathize with Job and we say, how much more was the very son of God suffering when he was uh, abandoned on the cross? when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness with a greater temptation than Job ever faced. Uh, it allows us to see how, how that how much more relationship. Christ is Yahweh, similar, right? When we see Jesus like Yahweh, we can say, yes, in the Old Testament, we get a vision of who God is in the book of Job. How much more do we get a vision of who God is in Christ? Yes, everything we'll learn about Yahweh is true of Christ, but in Jesus, we get a clearer picture of all of these truths. Christ is Job's mediator. Yes, Job wants a mediator. He desires a mediator, but Jesus is even the better mediator that Job never even knew he could desire. So it's not that the mediator refers to Jesus. It refers to this concept, and Jesus fulfills that concept in an even greater way. Same thing with God's wisdom, even better uh, than the gems that chapter 28 suggests. And so Christ then is the end or the telos of God's message in the book. As we will unpack the theology and teaching of the book in the coming weeks, we will realize that in Christ, all the truths of Job find a clearer and fuller expression that we may not have even appreciated without Job pointing us the way and showing us that such a truth can be found in Jesus in increasing measure. And so for the question for you, for the final discussion question, how would you answer the question, where is Jesus in the book of Job? Based on this discussion, how would you answer that question? Where is Jesus in the book of Job? Are you, do you uh, like this Christotelic approach that J Jesus is the ultimate aim for these themes and characters and ideas and concepts? Or do you, do you think that there is a very clear reference to Jesus in, in perhaps Job's mediator or some other, some other facet of the book? Where is Jesus in the book of Job? Thank you so much uh, for coming to class this week. Uh, I would look forward to being back with you next week as we make our way uh, through the Yahweh speeches. All right. On the back side of your handout, I've got a little chart there. There's the distinction, if you want to call it that, between a Christocentric and a Christotelic. And basically what this is coming down to is what's the interpretive method that a person would use, okay? And you can see the characteristics between the two. And I think, based on what he just described, you can see how of those four points, Christ as Job, Christ as Yahweh, Christ as Job's mediator, and Christ as God's wisdom, I think you can see how that possibly may fit into all four categories. So the question for you then is, where is Jesus in the book of Job? Take a few minutes and go through that. All right, anyone want to... Uh, 
share their thoughts on this one. You know, I see a lot of people on their phones. Hopefully you're on your Bible apps and you're not on a Wikipedia or something like that. Anybody want to share your thoughts on this one? As the questions get harder, we're less apt to talk. Craig. Okay, Karen says he's everywhere. So the restoration of Job is an example. Any other thoughts? Is suffering? That fits the Christ as Job criteria, right? Barb? Okay. There's the old saying that uh <coughs> how's it go? Bear with me a second. Uh Christ and the old concealed. No, the old and the the old and the new concealed. The new and the old revealed. How's that go? Help me out, Leah. <laughs> I gotta get it. I'd have to take it through again. But anyway, to your point, we're looking at it as New Testament believers, right? We we look at the Old Testament as New Testament believers. Neither approach is unbiblical. It's just basically they're they're just distinct ways of interpreting the Old Testament, and as New Testament believers, oftentimes we tend to read back into it from our New Testament perspective, but it's also important that we have an understanding that many of the Old Testament references to a Messiah are fulfilled in Jesus. So it's, it's kind of a balancing act in how we do that, um, if that makes sense. And you can kind of see the definitions there uh, that how much more in Jesus to the point of Job's Job's restoration was great, but how much more will be the restoration of the believers in Christ? So, keep these things in mind as we go forward with the class. Cooper's going to be building on these things. And basically, if you look down towards the bottom of your, of your page there, as we move forward, there's going to be some questions to answer. What do we do with God's first speech? We haven't heard from him yet. What's the significance of Job's silence in response to that speech? What do we do with God's second speech? And then what do we do with Job's confession? And what do we do with with God's condemnation of of the three friends and his commendation of Job in light of everything that we've seen so far? And what do we do with this whole thing of Job's restoration? You can see how the Christocentric or Christotelic approach may work in there. So as we go forward with the class, too, these are the things that he's going to be getting into. And ask yourself, which of these questions are you most interested in answering from that list? And are they interconnected? Is there any kind of an interconnection between these various questions that are given? And then finally, why do you think the book is designed to make us ask all these questions at the end? 
when we get there. Come back next week. Paul. I didn't answer it.